Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 131. I'm your host Natalie Gruniger and I'm so glad that you could join me. As always, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and tune into every episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. October's prize is a copy of my hearty commendations, the transcribed letters and remembrances of Thomas Cromwell by Caroline Angus. Thank you to the author for sponsoring this wonderful prize. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. At the end of the month, I'll be chatting to historian Gareth Russell about Catherine Howard and the Tudor Queens. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to register for the event. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, notebooks and apparel. New items will also be added over time. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I'd love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag I love Talking Tudors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Mary Tudor Brandon is Lacey Bona Hull. Lacey is a PhD candidate specialising in medieval and early modern women's and cultural history. She's currently writing her dissertation and teaching courses in both history and women's and gender studies for her university. Lacey also specialises in public history and has completed a three-month-long internship with the Institute of Historical Research in London, working on the Layers of London Digital History Project. She also runs a public history Twitter account where she records short videos on historical themes alongside her mostly docile cat. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales.
welcome to Talking Tutors, Lacey. How are you? I'm good, Natalie. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, so, thank you for having me. Thank you. Let's start with an introduction. So just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and maybe a bit about your background as well. Sure. So I am currently a PhD candidate at my university, and I am writing a dissertation on medieval gender and cultural history. And then I also have my master's degree uh, also in medieval history. Now, my first love was the tutors. That's kind of what sucked me in to actually studying history in school. But it seemed like as I was taking history classes on Tudor England, I just kept moving like further and further back in time with my interests, which has pretty solidly landed me around the year um, like 1100 to 1500, mostly focusing on England and France for my dissertation. And I do a lot of reading um, of different guidebooks and content conduct manuals and uh, courtly romances and literature to try and get sort of in the mindset of the people living at the time. And then I've been lucky enough that in the pre- COVID days, which now seem like they were forever ago, uh, my university sent me to London, Oxford, and Paris for a couple summers uh, back then. And I was able to do some research in the archives. And it was so fun to just be surrounded by different uh, medieval and Tudor documents and books and my beloved conduct manuals, which I'm sure I'll sneak in a little bit about when, when we're chatting about Mary today. Fantastic. I actually love those books as well. They're just, they're, they're so much fun, I find. And as you say, you can really get into the, the mindset of the people at the time, which is great. Now, you're obviously very busy because you're also working on a joint biography of Mary Tudor and Charles Brandon. So when did you first become interested in this Tudor kind of, I suppose we can call them a power couple? <laughs> Yeah, so I um, I am working on that in my spare time, which is kind of more difficult uh, to find these days because I, with my dissertation, I'm doing obviously a lot of writing, but then I do a lot of translating and transcribing of the medieval sources too, usually from Latin and medieval French into English. So it seems like right now I'm up to my eyeballs uh, in translations, but when I am relaxing in the evenings um, and then sometimes on that rare weekend where I have a little bit of extra time. I do like to work on a joint biography that I'm in the, I guess, still the research um, and a little bit of the writing stage of working on, on Mary Tudor Brandon and her husband, Charles Brandon. Now, with Mary Tudor, actually, first, uh, I was interested in Anne Boleyn, which I feel like so many of us are really drawn to the Tudors because of Anne Boleyn. I mean, she was such a dynamic character and just such a fascinating um, historical figure. And I have had, I've been Team Anne since I was about 11 or 12 and have had like probably borderline um, Anne Boleyn obsession <laughs> since that time, just reading anything I could get my hands on um, about Henry's second wife. And when I was doing some reading on Anne, I remember... It was probably about, probably about 14 or 15. I was reading about uh, the reactions to the marriage between Henry and Anne, and I had stumbled on Mary Tudor Brandon's reaction to the relationship that her brother uh, was having with Anne Boleyn. And I was just blown away by this woman who felt like she could say anything that she wanted to say to Henry about uh, Anne, which at the time that I mean, that was kind of a dangerous thing to do to, to cross, you know, Henry VIII uh, didn't like to be challenged. And I think it's interesting uh, that, that Mary not only challenged him, but still maintained like a pretty decent relationship with her brother. So I then wanted to start looking into Mary Tudor Brandon, who she was. She's a fiery personality. And then it was like, the more I read about Mary, the more I was interested in her as, as Henry's sister, but also as a political figure in her own right. And then as far as uh, Charles Brandon goes, I, I think it's really interesting to think about the young men that Henry VIII surrounded himself with, especially in the early days of his court. And Charles Brandon is one of those people who just, I mean, he really had staying power, even though he acted against Henry at different times uh, in his life, which I'm sure we'll be talking about. I mean, he he had a pretty rocky relationship with Henry uh, there for a while, but their, their relationship was mended and they ended up really being close until, um, until Charles died. And so I, I thought, how interesting would it be 
to work on a joint biography of these two because it's hard to it's hard to talk about Mary without Charles and Charles without Mary just because their relationship was so meaningful and so tied to their relationship with Henry and to look at how these two people who were so prominent in Henry's life how they kind of work together to to challenge Henry a little bit but to still maintain that really good relationship that they had with him. Yeah, I actually think, and um, hopefully we'll touch on this a little bit more later, but I, I think that's uh, a pretty much a unique example in Henry VIII's entire reign, the incident with his sister and Charles Brandon, because I struggled to find any other example where Henry forgave on that scale. And um, we'll come back to that because it's it's quite fascinating. I've been reflecting on it quite a bit lately, actually. So we're going to focus on Mary's life before her marriage, just to get started Mm -hmm. here, before her marriage to Charles Brandon, I should say, sorry. So tell us about her early years. I know we don't have a lot of information, but maybe just summarize what we do have. For example, what do we know about her relationship with Henry at the beginning? Yeah, sure. So Mary was the youngest surviving child of King Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. She was most likely born on March 18th, of 1496, which we have that great book of hours that belonged to her grandmother, Henry VII's mother, Margaret Beaufort, who recorded the birth dates of her grandchildren, which thank goodness she did, because I'm sure you, you know that all too often, like with Anne Boleyn, we don't know the birth dates and we don't know the birth dates, even of noble and sometimes royal women, especially. So we do think that we have Mary's birth date um, pegged to the 18th of March, 1496, and that she did grow up um, in pretty close contact with her older brother, Henry, and her older sister, Margaret. Now, her oldest sibling was, of course, Prince Arthur, who had his own household, and he was in training um, to take over his father's role of becoming King of England. So she didn't have that personal of a relationship with Arthur. She obviously would have been familiar with him as her brother, but it wasn't anything like the relationship that she had with Margaret, which from what we can tell was still nothing compared to the really close relationship that she had with her brother, Henry, who was about four years older than Mary was. So the two of them, they spent most of their childhood um, at different palaces, often within the same palace as their parents, which wasn't something that you saw happening all the time with royal children. But they they spent a lot of time um, at Sheen Palace, of course, until it unfortunately caught on fire in 1497, and then ended up being rebuilt. They spent a lot of time at Eltham. They spent a lot of time at Uh, Richmond Palace, which was one of the favorite residences of Henry VII. And it seems like Henry and Mary would have been together even sometimes in their educational pursuits. So I have read um, a scholar recently who thinks that if you compare the handwriting between Henry VIII and his sister Mary with their mother, Elizabeth of York, the, the similarities are odd um, and sort of unbelievable to where it almost leads you to think that maybe Elizabeth of York, who was known to be really heavily involved uh, in her children's lives, that maybe she even taught the two of them how to write, which we have so many surviving letters um, of Mary, especially from her time uh, as Queen of France. And she really used letter writing to her advantage. So we can tell that she likely did pay a lot of attention to grammar and literature. She uh, was really well versed in French and likely uh, Latin too, and that she might have been taught these different subjects at the same time as her brother Henry. So Mary did get um, a pretty good education, especially for being a girl uh, living in Tudor England. Now, We do have some record that indicates that Mary was likely pretty sick uh, as a child. So we know that an apothecary was employed to provide different medication to Mary throughout her childhood years, mostly from 1504 to 1509. And then in 1513, so this would be when Mary was about 17 years old, right actually before her first marriage, she had a doctor employed for 10 weeks to try and treat some ailment. Uh, that was affecting Mary. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any details of what this ailment was, but we do know that Mary, she suffered from different sicknesses throughout her life. And unfortunately, she likely did have her life cut short due to these uh, ailments that it looks like was even um, affecting her as a child. Now, she did a lot of traveling uh, with her brother Henry, her sister Margaret, and then of course, Catherine of Aragon, who was her sister-in-law. And this especially happened when 
Prince Arthur had unfortunately died and Catherine was returned to the court of Henry VII. And we actually have a pretty detailed record from the year 1504 saying that Henry VII took Mary and Catherine of Aragon with him in sort of a like mini progress, it almost sounds like, to different courts. He went uh, from Richmond to Windsor to take uh, a hunting trip and he took both girls with them. And then he went back to uh, Richmond again, then to Westminster and then eventually to Greenwich Palace. And it's fun for me to think about Mary and Catherine of Aragon being so close and really being almost like sisters. I mean, we know that Mary was uh, really well-versed in French and that Catherine had a little bit of trouble uh, learning English, especially early on, but that she was very well-versed in French. And so it's it's sort of easy to think about Mary and Catherine really being more like sisters than sisters-in-law, uh, especially following Arthur's death because Catherine was, you know, kind of on her own uh, there for a while in England. And it seems like she and Mary were really close with each other at this time. We don't know. I'm I'm someone who really likes to uh, learn about like the different books that historical figures would have had access to because I'm, you know, someone who loves books myself. So I have done a little bit of reading on the different books that uh, were in Henry VII's collection at Richmond that we know that uh, Catherine of Aragon likely used his library. And so it wouldn't be too much of a stretch of the imagination to think that Mary, when she was traveling with Catherine of Aragon to Richmond would have likely also used this library. And that would mean that Mary had access to kind of like the heavy hitters of the late Middle Ages and early modern period as far as literature goes. So they would have likely been able to read um, like the Romance of the Rose and the works of Christine de Pizan. They probably were familiar with the Griselda and the Melusine myths and that they might have even read um, the Canterbury Tales. We know that a copy was owned again by Margaret Beaufort, which was, of course, Mary's uh, paternal grandmother. And I think we can draw a direct connection between Mary being familiar with these different conduct manuals and works of courtly literature of the Arthurian legends and the role that she was expected to play at court as an English princess. So she was obviously born at a time when the Tudor dynasty was still a little shaky. They didn't have the benefit of hindsight that we have now to know what an absolute powerhouse um, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, the I would end up being. At the time when Mary was born, there were still the different pretenders um, to the throne challenging Henry VII. There were still fears that Henry VII was going to be dethroned by an uprising. Things weren't necessarily set in stone. And so Mary, conveniently, as a young, beautiful English princess, was held up as sort of this like personification of the Tudor Rose. So she was thought to represent the combination of the House of York and the House of Lancaster. And she was treated um, accordingly. She was kind of like put up on a pedestal a little bit and shown off at all of the different courtly pageants. We know when she was only 11 years old, uh, she was the Queen of May at the May Day pageants where she is the one who issued the challenge uh, to the jousters. And then she rewarded the winning jouster um, with his ring. And then the very next month, she again called some jousts in her own name that were actually themed to give honor to King Arthur and the Knights of the round table. So the Tudor court was heavily laden with symbolism and with uh, these ideas of magnificence and grandeur and grace. And Mary was really one of the people who they held up as being really symbolic of everything that was great about um, Henry VIII and the Tudor dynasty that he was trying to establish at the time. Yeah, so much great information and and funny that a lot of it I've been actually thinking about recently. And just to mention to our our wonderful listeners, if you want to hear more about that immersion in the the culture of courtly love and and the Arthurian legends and romances, I I recently just chatted to the wonderful Sarah Griswood and her new book, The Tudors in Love, has is all about is all about courtly love. So that episode is live. You can go and listen to that. And it's wonderful. And it actually links a lot to what you have just been saying there. So it's really fascinating. And so I wanted to touch a little bit more on Mary's relationship with with Catherine. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that developed as the two got older? Yeah, sure. So so like I said, Mary and Catherine really come off in the sources as being more like sisters than sisters-in-law. So the the first time that 
little Mary uh, would have seen Catherine is when she was progressing um, into London in October of 1501, right before her marriage um, to Prince Arthur. And this just, I mean, this must have seemed like a time where everything was starting to come together uh, for the Tudors. Henry VII was making a lot of really important political alliances. He had surviving, thriving children. Everything looked like it was in line for Arthur um, to become the king. And then, of course, everything came crashing down around them. It's in this really, like a time of upheaval and a time of turmoil where we see Catherine and Mary um, seem to really connect on on a more personal level. And of course, that's that's kind of trying to read uh, between the lines and the sources a bit because you might have a, a chronicle that mentions um, where the two of them were together or you might have like, like an expense account that mentions where the two of them were together to where we kind of have to connect the dots a little bit and to say, look, this youngest daughter of Henry VII was spending so much time with Catherine of Aragon, that there has to be more to it than the two of them just happening to be within proximity of one another. Now, when Arthur dies, we get that just really touching uh, image of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York when Elizabeth says, you know, it's not too late. We can still have a second son, right? To to kind of be like the heir and the spare for Henry VIII. And of course, she does end up getting pregnant. And unfortunately, she dies immediately after giving birth to an infant daughter who also unfortunately died in an early 1503. So this is just months after um, Arthur's death is when Mary loses not only her brother, but also her mother in quick succession. And then of course, her older sister, Margaret is married off in Scotland in 1503 in August, she leaves her father's court and moves to Scotland. So Mary, her entire world um, was shaken up. And at the same time, so was Catherine of Aragon, she had lost her husband, who was really her most immediate connection in this foreign country that she had only gone to so that she could be his wife. And so the two of them are sort of thrown together with this uh, really unfortunate series of events and close family deaths to the two of them. But what we see is a blossoming um, of a relationship. The two of them were together pretty regularly from the year 1502, when Arthur died, until 1514, uh, when Mary leaves for France. We uh, see them together at different banquets. We see them together at balls and jousts. We have um, a really neat example from 1506, when uh, Catherine's sister and brother-in-law were blown off course on their way back to Spain and they found themselves uh, at Henry VII's court. And of course, he instantly pulls out uh, Mary and Catherine and just, it seems like kind of tells them, you know, to perform a little bit. Um, And they, they of course, show off uh, for Catherine's relatives. And that actually um, helped leads to a proxy marriage that took place between Mary and Catherine of Aragon's nephew, the future um, Charles V in December of 1508. We have reason to believe that uh, Catherine of Aragon was also likely involved in the setting up of this proxy marriage. And then we know that she is the person who escorted Mary actually to the wedding of her nephew. And then they sit together at the celebratory jousts afterwards. And they, they seem like they're sharing, you know, in the excitement that since Mary doesn't have Uh, her mother there to guide her anymore. And since she doesn't have her older sister there to guide her, she, it seems like she is sort of taking to Catherine of Aragon and having Catherine assume this motherly role, um, or at least an older sister type of role. I mean, Catherine was only about 10 years older than Mary. So there wasn't that big of an age difference. But Catherine had already been through marriage uh, with Arthur would be able to kind of give Mary, I guess, a little bit of a heads up um, on what to expect on that front and was able to, to actually help draw that connection between Mary and her nephew so that Mary's future would still be within Catherine of Aragon's family. Now, we also know that when uh, that marriage fell through and when Mary ended up becoming betrothed uh, to Louis XII of France, which is something that happened due to the machinations of Wolsey and Henry VIII whenever he uh, took over as king, we know that Catherine, even though she was heavily pregnant, she accompanied Mary to Dover so that she could see her off. Instead of just telling her goodbye um, in London at court, she actually, it took 
took her a while to get there. She uh, didn't make it to Dover quite as quickly as Mary um, and Henry VIII did. But Catherine of Aragon still insisted on um, accompanying Mary to Dover so that she could be there to tell her goodbye uh, when she left for France. And of course, she uh, she ended up, unfortunately, Catherine giving birth uh, to a stillborn son just a couple of months later. But when Mary does come back from France, she and Catherine are reunited with what I would imagine to be um, a happy reunion. And both of them fell pregnant really close uh, to the same time together with Catherine being pregnant uh, with who would end up becoming the future Mary the first of England, and then Mary becoming pregnant with her first son, uh, that Henry Brandon that she would share with Charles Brandon. So the two of them, they ended up experiencing uh, a lot of real hardships together. But they also experienced a lot of what you would imagine to be happy milestones, um, especially both of them carrying successful pregnancies together and giving birth, right? I mean, it's it was within like a month of each other, the two of them gave birth, which, which I think kind of uh, goes to show that there's another layer likely uh, within their, their close relationship. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? When you think about it, that not only were they drawn, as you said, together by those tragedies that occurred early Mm -hmm. on, but obviously Mary was at a very impressionable age, wasn't she? When Catherine comes on the scene and Catherine herself is formidable and and quite remarkable. So it it makes sense that she would be drawn to her. And, and as you say, without her mother and without Margaret around, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, she had that. She still had that strong female uh, role model, yes. which I think is is something that too many noble women at the time didn't. They didn't automatically have that. Um, someone like Catherine of Aragon in their life to sort of, I guess, model their own behavior off of. And of course, we see that Mary does become a a formidable woman um, in her own right. And you do you have to wonder how much of that uh, was was Catherine of Aragon the inspiration for. Yes. Now you mentioned, obviously, there's another marriage coming up, the one to Louis Mm -hmm. XII. So we're going to touch on that in a moment. But before we do that, what do we actually know about Mary's appearance? I know, you know, she's often depicted in a few different ways in portraits and of her personality, I suppose. Are there any contemporary accounts? Yes, there are. So so Mary was someone who you you have to be kind of careful because since she was royalty, it's not uncommon to have different accounts uh, throughout the Middle Ages and the early modern period of royal women just being like the end all be all um, of beauty because they're the people who were writing these accounts had a vested interest in sort of bragging on the appearance of these women. But by all accounts, Mary was um, exceptionally beautiful. She sort of embodied this late medieval, early modern ideal of beauty and grace. The descriptions that we have of her uh, imply that she likely got her looks after her mother, Elizabeth of York, who is known to be very beautiful. And then also uh, from her mother's side of the family, the Woodvilles, who were known to, to be some of the most beautiful women in the realm. And Mary really follows uh, in their footsteps. We have some accounts from the Venetian ambassador who said that Mary was tall, that she was slender, she had gray eyes, and she did not have any match uh, in all of England with her golden hair and her light complexion, which um, the beauty standards of the time really wanted that light colored hair. They wanted uh, a pale face that was thought to to symbolize um, the ideal beauty. We have a couple different people saying that she was one of the most beautiful women in all of Christendom, which is just quite a compliment. Erasmus visited the court when Mary was only four years old, uh, but then he ended up reflecting on that visit in later years. And he said that nature never formed anything more beautiful. And she excelled no less in goodness and wisdom. So that's some pretty high praise. She also um, was said to be of medium height, that she had a good figure. She was not overly melancholy. So she wasn't overly like sad um, or depressed that she was instead lively. She was often um, the center of attention. It was thought to uh, be sort of like a good sign that she had a good amount of 
life in her, which would also likely signify fertility and sort of a a love of life. There are a lot of descriptions from when she landed in France, because this was a time in Mary's life where even more than usual, all eyes uh, were on her. So we have a couple of descriptions saying that she is handsome and well favored. And I like this part, were not her eyes and eyebrows too light. So we get we get a little bit um, of kind of a criticism in there, something that she obviously, you know, couldn't help, um, but that someone felt the need to record that she was slight rather than defective from corpulence and conducts herself with so much grace and has such good manners that for her age of 18 years, and she does not look more, she is a paradise, which what a uh, what a description to to give to someone. Now, someone who did see her (laughs) land in France said that she might be a little too pale, but they were going to chalk that up um, to seasickness from her, her rocky voyage to France. So she uh, was sort of given an out for, for looking too pale because she didn't have the easiest time on the boat that she had to take from England to France. And then Louis, of course, her husband said that she was a nymph from heaven. And he actually said that before he even met Mary, but by all accounts, when he did meet Mary, he was absolutely, Absolutely smitten. We have uh, letters that Louis wrote to Henry just thanking him profusely for letting him marry his sister, which kind of paints, I guess, a sweet picture. I know we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll chat about Louis and Mary and how they might be a mismatched pair, but we know that he, he did seem like he was very in love with Mary if only based on her physical appearance, um, he he had nothing but compliments for her. Now, we do have a couple portraits of Mary that we have confirmed to be Mary. There is one sketch of Mary uh, when she is in mourning that we we can get kind of a little bit of gl- a glimpse into what Mary would have looked like when her husband, uh, Louis XII, passed away. We have the marriage portrait between uh, Mary Tudor Brandon and Charles Brandon, where we, we certainly see in those two portraits that Mary Mary is beautiful and that she would have definitely held up to all of those standards of beauty in the eyes of society at the time. And then there is also the uh, marriage tapestry at Hever Castle. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's in the same room as Anne Boleyn's Books of Hours. And it is, it's a beautiful tapestry depicting the marriage between Mary uh, and Louis XII. And it's It's a fun one to look at uh, online. So if any of your listeners are wanting um, to check this out, it's fun because Anne Boleyn might be in it. It's it's obvious that uh, Mary and Louis are, and you can tell who they are um, in the tapestry, but it's fun to look at some of the other women in the tapestry and wonder if one of them is uh, Anne Boleyn or her sister, Mary Boleyn, both of whom might have been uh, at the wedding. Yes, I love that tapestry. I've actually stood right in front there and, and you know, examined it closely. I have a favourite oh. that I think is Anne, so I, I might share that on social media and, and see what people think if they agree, because I think just immediately you get a sense, you know, you feel connected to someone, and I felt connected to a certain lady oh, in that portrait. <laughs> oh, I'm, ex- I'm excited to see who you think it is, Natalie, because I just, I mean, I keep going back and forth between who I think. Between um, a couple. I think there's a couple yeah, that a couple. It took me like, oh, is it, is it, is it? But yeah, I think I've, I've decided on once. So I will share that with you. After. Okay, that's. I mean, I do. I feel like they. There are a couple there that definitely give off a vibe where yeah. you know you you think they. It it might it might be it might be it Anne. We don't be. know. I'll you be looking know. forward to seeing who you think. Awesome, <laughs> excellent. You've mentioned that, of course, Wolsey and mm-hmm. and Henry had a hand in this marriage with Louis the Twelfth of France. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so England and France um, had traditionally not been the best of friends, right? The two countries um, had been at war on and off. And when Henry VIII came to the throne, he saw an opportunity to try and make peace really at the urging um, of Cardinal Wolsey to make peace with France and to do that through the marriage of his sister. And this is something that that Mary would have certainly expected uh, her entire life. It was It was just assumed that a royal woman would have to make a strategic marriage to the good of the realm uh, that she was born into. And so I don't think she was entirely surprised that she was going um, 
to make an alliance uh, through her marriage, I think what was surprising to her is that she had lived most of her life up until that point when she was um, 17 or 18 years old. She had lived most of her life assuming that she was going to marry the future Charles V and that she was going to help England to make those strong ties um, to the Habsburgs and to the emperor. Now, this obviously fell through um, in exchange for having uh, a better relationship between England and France. And so when she renounced uh, her betrothal to Charles V, she almost immediately was then betrothed to Louis XII, who had been the king of France uh, for 17 years. He was a really beloved individual. Um, The French people, by most accounts, you know, loved, they loved Louis and he was considered to be a pretty good king. The issue there is that he was 52 years old. He wasn't in uh, the best of health. He had been sort of struggling for a couple of years with gout and uh, the negative impacts of that. And Mary was 18 and she was beautiful and she was sort of like I mean, the the rose of the Tudor court. And so I'm sure this, this marriage wasn't something that Mary necessarily looked forward to, but it was something that she knew was just in the cards for her and that she couldn't really fight against her brother as far as, as this marriage would go. Now, Louis himself, this was going to be his third marriage. He had been married um, to Joan of France, who was the daughter of King Louis XI, who was king, obviously, prior to uh, Louis XII. But what he claimed was that this marriage was not consummated. So this gives uh, some interesting echoes uh, for the the big debate between Arthur and Catherine of Aragon that would obviously take over Henry's just entire mind uh, in a couple decades. But he, Louis had said that that marriage um, was not consummated on account of Joan, his wife, being malformed. Now, Joan uh, fought back against that at the time, saying that it had been consummated, that she had witnesses who said that they had heard Louis brag about mounting his wife three or four times in one night. But the Pope did side uh, with Louis and he gave him an annulment. He said that Louis had been forced to marry Joan by her father, the King of France. And then Louis conveniently married Anne of Brittany, who was the widow of Charles VIII. Uh, who had been the brother of Joan of France and who had been the king, but who had died childless. Now, Anne of Brittany didn't necessarily want to marry Louis XII, but he ended up marrying her and they had quite a number of stillborn sons, but their only surviving children were two daughters. One was Claude, who was born in 1499, right right after they got married. And then one was René, who was born in 1510. So when Anne died in January of 1514, Louis was back on the market and he was in search of that ever elusive heir, which is something that anyone interested in Henry VIII, I think can kind of understand that that can really be all consuming for kings to try and make sure that they have a male heir uh, set up and ready when they themselves would pass away. And Louis already being in ill health and being 52 years old, he was in a hurry to marry and to marry someone who he thought could give him a son. And so this is where Mary Tudor comes in to play. She married Louis by proxy in August of 1514, where she ended up having this ceremony where she married one of Louis's dukes. And then we have that really awkward scene where the two of them had to symbolically consummate the marriage uh, with the Duke having his pants rolled up uh, to the thigh and the two of them laying in the same bed and the Duke had to touch his leg to marry Tudor's leg. And then after that, supposedly the marriage was symbolically consummated and there wasn't, there wasn't much going back for Mary after that. So she ended up leaving about a month later. She left for Dover with her brother, Henry, where she was going to depart and make her way to France to have her actual marriage to Louis the 12th and to be crowned uh, queen of France. And like I said, um, a little bit ago, Henry and Catherine both accompanied her to Dover, but the trip didn't go exactly as planned. There were massive storms. They were delayed by almost a week and a half to leave Dover. And you have to wonder if Mary thought that that was like a a sign uh, for her impending marriage, that it seemed like everything was just working against her actually getting on that boat and making her way to France. And then what we're told is that at 2 a.m. on October 2nd, Mary and her ladies were woken up and they were told that there was a break in the storm and that they needed to get on their boat and make their way over to France because Louis was not wanting to waste any more time. He 
sort of knew that he was on the clock and wanted that male heir. And when Henry supposedly was at the water side with Mary while she was getting ready to get on a boat, she claims that she asked Henry to make her a promise that if she married the first time for Henry and his preferences, which would have been her marriage to Louis XII, that if she outlived Louis, she would get to choose her second husband. And according to Mary, Henry agreed, which it's hard to see Henry VIII wanting to give up um, any of that power. But I think it speaks to the close relationship that Henry and Mary did have growing up, that they continued to have uh, as they were teenagers in this very close sibling bond that can sometimes even transcend politics. Now, Henry, if he did agree to it, he might not have planned to uphold uh, his end of the bargain, but supposedly he did say that he would let Mary choose uh, her second husband. And so with that, Mary jumped on a boat. She had a really rocky voyage um, over to France. Her boat was actually run ashore and she had to be carried from her boat through the water um, to the shores of France, actually by one of um, Catherine of Aragon's knights who she had sent uh, to accompany Mary. But she, she finally made it to France. She met with Louis by quote unquote surprise before the wedding. Louis pretended like he was out hawking and he accidentally stumbled upon uh, Mary and her retinue, which you wonder how uh, how much of that was planned, which I think probably all of it. But he he claimed that it was a surprise. He wanted to see what Mary looked like, most likely. And when he did see Mary, we have a cute story. I don't know if it's historically accurate or not, but we do have a, a fun image of Mary blowing Louis a kiss. And Louis being really confused uh, by the custom and sort of of struggling for a second. And then he copied Mary and and blew her a kiss back. And uh, and the two of them departed. They ended up obviously meeting up again um, on October 9th for their wedding, where uh, the two of them had this really elaborate ceremony, which is what's depicted um, in the marriage tapestry. And then supposedly Mary left the ball that was following the ceremony or the banquet. And she was led to Louis's bedchamber where he claims again uh, that he crossed the river three times that night and would have crossed more um, if he if he had wanted to do so. So either, uh, either Louis is a big bragger um, or or these, these uh, marital relations were actually um, happening, which were led to believe that their marriage was consummated and that it was um, a valid and legitimate wedding and marriage between Mary and Louis XII. Yeah, that's, all those um, those comments remind me of Arthur's comment as well. I, mm-hmm. I think he said he'd been in Spain that night or some, something along, yeah. you know, along those lines. Something after else being with always Catherine. very... Um, yeah, very crude. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Tell me about it. And what do we know? So Mary was in France um, for not too long, but she she was mm-hmm. there for a time. What do we know of her time while she was there? Did they go anywhere? Did they do any little progresses or, or what well, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so so her relationship with Louis, it didn't start off on the best foot because when um, it was almost immediately uh, after the wedding, it was just within a couple of days, Louis dismissed almost all of Mary's ladies in waiting and dismissed a woman by the name of Mother Guildford, who is someone who Mary was close with throughout her life, uh, someone who actually came out of retirement to accompany Mary to France and to be um, a lady of the bedchamber so that she could give Mary advice on how to be a wife, uh, but also how to maintain uh, England's best interests while she was married uh, to the King of France. And so it caused a little bit of a rocky relationship at the beginning between Mary and Louis that he said uh, that her English ladies were keeping him away from her, that they uh, wanted Mary, especially Mother Guildford, wanted Mary all to themselves uh, and that they they were kind of cutting into his time as a husband with his new wife. And we have some letters where Mary is just, I mean, she's just beside herself complaining to Henry and Woolsey, who's, who she saw uh, is being a a close ally at the court of her brother. And she is saying, you know, he he has sort of taken everyone away from me who I have been comfortable with. I feel like I'm all alone here. Can you please have my ladies reinstated? And of course, being across the channel, there really wasn't anything that they could do. Being a new wife, uh, Mary just had to kind of unfortunately, unfortunately go along with whatever her husband had that out for her. And so after after a couple of days uh, of her being upset um, and pretty distraught, she ended up just resigning herself to the fact uh, that she would 
really only have the ladies with her uh, that Louis approved of and that she was going to have to assume her new role as Queen of France. Now, like I said, Louis was not in great health and it sort of limited the amount of travel that the two of them could do together. Now, they did travel to different palaces um, around Paris and we have the um, accounts of the coronation ceremony for Mary that Louis did watch, but that mostly Louis's son-in-law, the future Francis I, took part in where Mary was crowned in November and that Francis had to hold the crown above her head because the crown was just so heavy with jewels that Mary was sort of like crushed under the weight of it. So he had to stand um, behind Mary, which is a really fun visual to think of Francis I standing or the future Francis I standing there holding this crown above the head of the woman who was possibly going to be a direct threat uh, to him assuming the, the throne of France. Because if Mary, of course, ended up getting pregnant and had a son, that child is who um, would take over as King of France when Louis died instead of his son-in-law, Francis, who had been married to Louis's oldest daughter, Claude. So we we do have some interesting accounts of what was going on in Paris at the time. We know about a tournament that Francis planned in Mary's honor following her coronation that Charles Brandon actually took part in. And Mary watched these tournaments and these jousts with her husband, but that Louis was so ill at the time that he actually had to recline um, on a couch to be able to watch the the tournaments. But he did kind of get a little dig in at Francis and the uh, French participants when he said that the English jousters really put the French to shame. So that's a it's it's interesting to think about Mary's relationship with Charles Brandon at that time when her husband was still alive. And was she sort of juggling her feelings uh, for Charles Brandon while still still trying to be a good and attentive wife to Louis XII. And by all records that we have, Mary was a good and attentive wife to Louis. When they did travel, even when he was sort of bed bound uh, for the majority of their marriage, she we have descriptions of her sitting by Louis's bedside and singing to him or talking with him or just trying to entertain him and make his make his life a little bit easier and to raise his spirits a little bit. She spent most of her time with Louis, Francis, Claude, and then Francis's mother, um, Louise of Savoy. She spent a lot of time with um, the four of them. That sort of became her new family. We don't know necessarily the nature of the relationship between Mary and Francis and his mother, but we do know that it seems like Francis and, and Mary got along decently well and that Mary likely had a good relationship with Claude, Louis's oldest daughter, and that she did have a good relationship with Renee, but Renee uh, was so young at the time that, you know, it's not like she was uh, heavily involved in any of the political maneuver- maneuverings that would have been going on at the French court. But so they ended up leaving Paris to try and spend the weeks leading up to Christmas in a palace up north. But when they got there, Louis was just in horrible shape. Um, they stayed there for a couple of weeks, but his doctors really encouraged him to return to Paris, which he did right after Christmas, the the court returned to Paris where Louis was supposed to be on a pretty strict diet. He was supposed to be exercising. He was supposed to avoid um, getting excited because his health was seen as being um, in such danger. And of course, people blame Mary for this. Even at, at the time, people said that because Louis was trying to impress his new wife. He didn't follow the uh, guidance of his doctors. And he unfortunately did pass away on um, January 1st. And Mary had been his wife uh, for less than three months. So it was it was a short-lived marriage, but it was a pretty impactful one for Mary herself. Ah, thank you. And there's a, another young woman that was at the court at the time mm-hmm. that I think m- uh, most listeners will, will recognize. And that was, I think, um, a teenaged Anne Boleyn. People don't yes. agree with this. Some think it was a, uh, a probably seven or eight year old Anne Boleyn, which I don't think makes any sense. But anyway, no. so a young Anne Boleyn was also in France in the service of Queen Mary. Do we know what their relationship was like? Obviously, it's just a short period of time that she's mm-hmm. in fact queen. But what what information do we have about that? 
Yeah. So, so from what we can tell, there was really not much love lost between Mary and Anne, even at this early stage in their relationship. What we have as far as Mary discussing the women who were left over when most of her preferred English ladies were dismissed is that she decided that she would make do with what she had, but that she wasn't happy about it. And from what we can tell, Anne was likely in that group of women who were left over, who Mary was less than thrilled uh, to be in the presence of. Now, I personally don't think that the two of them would have had any sort of bad blood between the two of them as individuals. I think that Anne Boleyn, um, sort of knowing how just astute and smart she was as a person, it's not like she was going to do anything to offend or to make upset the woman who she was serving as queen. I think she it, she was a little too smart uh, to do that. But I think that Mary didn't see Anne as being someone... It, she wasn't someone that she knew from England. She wasn't someone that she knew from back home. She wasn't someone who Mary felt was aligned with the English interests. It seems like Mary felt that the ladies who were left over to her were maybe in the pocket of the French. And of course, when Anne stayed on um, in France after Louis's death so that she could serve the new French queen, that probably only solidified that fear that Mary had. So when they're in France together, we don't have any sort of, of historical record saying that, that the two of them uh, had any ill will towards one another or any negative feelings between Mary and Anne, who is specifically named as an individual. We do know that they crossed paths again, uh, when Anne returned to England, where they were both in that pageant where Mary played beauty and Anne played perseverance, which I just think, I mean, it's what amazing, isn't it? How yeah, prophetic. <laughs> what, it's just beautiful, historical foreshadowing, you know, it's just, it's, it's something that always gives me chills. Um, whenever, when I think of Anne having the role of perseverance and then just, I mean, like I said, uh, when we first started talking, I am, nothing if not an Anne Boleyn fan and, and a cheerleader uh, for Anne. And so when when I read about, you know, that pageant in particular, it's more from the viewpoint um, of Anne even than of Mary and how uh, Anne must have, you know, felt during that experience. But Henry also, you know, took part in the pageant. And that was something that, that Mary uh, and her brother Henry did quite often, that the two of them were constantly um, in different like masks and pageants together that they sort of put on like those plays uh, for the English court, even when Mary um, ended up returning home. Now, what's obviously most well known about the relationship between Mary and Anne is what happened when Anne was having her affair uh, with Henry VIII. And that Mary was, I mean, she was really outspoken about not approving of this relationship that her brother was in. And it wasn't like Anne Boleyn was the first mistress of Henry VIII. I mean, he had had dozens of mistresses that we don't have any sort of record um, of Mary having such strong feelings towards, but she did have strong feelings towards Anne and especially uh, strong feelings for her brother wanting to annul his marriage um, or divorce Catherine of Aragon. And I, I do think that that's, I don't think it's so much Anne as a person. I think it's Catherine as a person that Mary was so close with that this was someone uh, who she loved probably from her first memories. And then her brother uh, was threatening to sort of cast her aside. Now we do have sort of like the, the culminating point of this bad relationship between uh, Mary Tudor Brandon and Anne Boleyn. And that was in uh, March of 1532, when there was a scuffle between the men of the Duke of Norfolk, who was Anne Boleyn's uncle, and the men of the Duke of Suffolk, which was Charles Brandon, so Mary's um, husband. And these men ended up um, sort of brawling and one of them was unfortunately killed, who was um, one of Charles, Charles Brandon's men and one of his kinsmen. And what was to blame for this scuffle is that supposedly Mary had said something really negative uh, and hurtful about Anne Boleyn. Now, we don't know what Mary was supposed to have said, um, but it was something that caused such turmoil uh, that that a man unfortunately lost his life and actually Cromwell uh, had to come in and, and break it up with his sweet talking ways, which isn't surprising <laughs> with, with Cromwell. But it does go to show that this, this relationship between the two of them, even though it spanned, you know, over 15 years, it was probably never something that was pleasant, even, even back uh, in France before the two of them would have really had any opportunity to get to know each other. Yeah, it's a fascinating relationship, that one, isn't it? But I, I agree with you. I think it does have a lot more to do with 
Catherine and then in her relationship mm-hmm. with Mary than with Anne, unfortunately. So Mary's husband died on, on New Year's Day, 1515, as you've said. So how did how did the French court react to this news? And what were the, what was sort of the immediate aftermath of that? Yeah, so so like I said, Louis was really popular. He was uh, really well loved. He was really well respected. He was actually given the nickname, the father of the people, because he was just so beloved by his country and to an extent by his court. Now, I I don't think that Francis uh, was necessarily too upset about the passing um, of his father-in-law. Louise of Savoy, who um, is Francis's mother, actually recorded something in her diary that was just very straight to the point and matter of fact that um, essentially said the French king died. Now my son is the king. So I do think that there were different factions at court um, who didn't have too much sympathy for Mary and were not too upset at the passing of Louis because his death wasn't entirely unexpected. They didn't necessarily know that he was going to be dying at the time, but they knew that he was in ill health. Now, Mary supposedly was just completely shocked when she was told uh, that her husband had died. People say uh, that she instantly fainted and that she sort of had to be, you know, brought back to to deal with this sudden death um, of her husband. And according to French tradition, she went into mourning and seclusion for uh, 40 days, mostly to make sure that she wasn't pregnant. Because like I said, if she had been pregnant with with Louis' heir, then obviously things would have to be sort of put on hold as far as Francis uh, and his coronation would go. But she uh, had to shut herself up. She wore um, all white, which was the traditional French color of mourning. And she was known as as the the white queen at the time. And that's where we get that one sketch of uh, Mary just looking sad uh, and distraught at the death of her husband. Now she had been originally surrounded with ladies who were again unfamiliar to her so not even the women that she had been used to serving her when Louis was still alive but they were ladies who were put in place by uh, Francis's mother and who she again thought would be more loyal to Francis uh, and his wife Claude than they would be to Mary and she she stuck with those women for a couple of days and then she originally she uh, eventually dismissed them and she asked to have her uh, original ladies back to give her some comfort. Where that comfort, I think, really came into play uh, is when Charles Brandon and two other men uh, arrived in Paris uh, at the French court to retrieve Mary, to start the negotiations, to have Mary return to England. And I would imagine that that sight of Charles Brandon, after being sort of alone uh, for an entire month and a half, was something that was all too... uh, welcoming to Mary and that we of course know uh, that she acted on pretty hastily from what we can tell. Yes, absolutely. And I want to hear more about that. So so what happens after the, the so there's the 40 days seclusion, um, Charles Brandon then kind of sweeps in again. And, <laughs> and what what takes place after that? Yeah, Charles is, uh, he's he's pretty good at, at doing that. Talk about like a knight in shining armor uh, type of image that was Charles Brandon. So he he was sent by Henry to go to France to to bring Mary back essentially, but to also bring back as many uh, jewels and plates as he could with Mary because Henry was not wanting to obviously let go of any wealth that Louis had given to Mary in her own right. They obviously uh, couldn't take any of the like French crown jewels that belonged to the French queen, but Mary as queen was given a lot of gifts. Even in that short amount of time that she was married to Louis, he just piled gifts uh, on top of her all the time. And so Henry had sent Charles to try and and negotiate this return while maintaining as much of the wealth that Mary had accumulated while in France as was possible. Now, what Henry supposedly said to Charles before he left England was, don't marry my sister. And what Woolsey said to Mary in a letter was, don't make any hasty marriages. So it seems like Henry and Woolsey were pretty well aware of some sort of interest between Mary and Charles Brandon. And of course, with Charles being Henry's best friend throughout his entire life, we don't have any reason to think that Mary and Charles wouldn't have known each other and known each other decently well, that we know that their paths crossed a ton before Mary went to France and that the two of them uh, had a pretty good uh, working relationship. We don't know the extent of that relationship, but we know that that the two of them were certainly familiar with each other. So when Charles arrives uh, to try and negotiate Mary's return, she says that Francis was 
planning to marry her off to someone to benefit France and that she thought that Henry was going to try to marry her off to someone to benefit England. And that if that was the case, she was just going to go into a religious house, that she was going to uh, become a nun. She wasn't going to marry anyone else. She said that Henry had promised her that she could marry whoever she wanted to marry and that she chose Charles. Now, Charles, it doesn't sound like for his part, put up much of a fight. It seems like he completely forgot about that promise that he made to Henry, or maybe he thought that Henry's promise uh, to marry kind of offset the promise that he had made to Henry. We aren't exactly sure how Charles justified his decisions, but he ended up marrying Mary in a secret ceremony in front of only about 10 people pretty immediately after he arrived in France. And then the two of them start just this frantic letter writing campaign uh, to Henry and Woolsey trying to explain themselves, trying to talk about the situation, trying to take blame really off of Charles and put it on Mary because it was it was treason. Uh, and Charles could have lost his life for marrying the king's sister. They knew that Mary wasn't going to lose her life uh, as the king's favorite sister as a you know royal woman, but that Charles was was in a pretty precarious position there for a bit. Now, eventually, after promising Henry tons of money in, in repayment to try and buy back his love, the two of them were able to come back to England. They were able to officially get married um, in front of Henry and Catherine of Aragon on 13th of May, uh, 1515. And they went on to spend the rest of their lives trying to, trying to improve the relationship that they had with Henry there for a while. But then eventually they were allowed back in Henry's good graces and, and it kind of seems like to a certain extent, Henry was doing um, all of his pouting sort of for appearances that he he likely had already forgiven Mary and Charles, but that he wasn't one to turn down money. So he was he was still going to take their um, their repayments. But the two of them ended up having a, a good relationship with Henry. They went on to have four children together. And then Charles had two children from a previous marriage. And they everything everything seemed like it it worked out pretty well for Mary and Charles that maybe they even had a true love match until Mary's unfortunate death uh, in June of 1533 that actually happened right after Anne Boleyn's coronation mm -hmm. so her her enemy uh, was crowned Queen of England and then Mary unfortunately didn't live to see uh, much of the aftermath of that. Yeah, it's always interesting when you look at the dates isn't it and you see like all mm -hmm. the connections and that just fascinating so there's obviously a lot of different theories as to why Henry perhaps reacted the way he did and and how Charles Brandon managed to get out of this situation. You know, some people think obviously it has to do with the fact that Henry was still very young and, you know, mm -hmm. he hadn't, that streak of cruelty perhaps hadn't fully developed yet in him as it would later. But what do you think? Why do you think he, he didn't act against Charles Brandon like he would and the money of course I think is a a big um a, big, so. a key a key because as you say Henry loved wealth and money however if you think to um to the situation with Anne Boleyn later mm -hmm. Francis Weston's family for example offered them completely everything they had to save him and Henry said no so mm -hmm. what what do you think was the reason why he let Charles Brandon off so lightly so I think I think Woolsey had a, a big part to play in that. Woolsey had a pretty good relationship still at that time with uh, Charles Brandon and with Mary Tudor. He was really fighting for them. Uh, we have different letters that he and Mary wrote back and forth to each other when Mary was still in France, but after she had secretly married Charles, where he was even sort of like editing the letters that Mary was going to be sending to her brother to try because he, of course, knew Henry. I mean, like like the back of his hand, you know, better than almost anyone knew Henry and that Woolsey felt pretty confident that he knew how to win Henry's forgiveness. Now he, Woolsey himself did not let Mary and Charles Brandon off the hook. He, he told them in no uncertain terms, this was a really horrible decision. I don't know why you did this without at least coming back to England first, you know, hinting that, that Henry might have been open to the idea of marriage as long as it happened, like you said, on Henry's terms. Henry did not like to be surprised. He didn't like to have um, his authority challenged. I think Woolsey played a big part. I think Mary being his favorite sister 
and just that relationship that the two of them had throughout their lives. I mean, they were as inseparable as she seemed to have been with Catherine of Aragon. Henry was almost always right there too. And when Henry took over as king, I mean, he just absolutely lavished Mary in gifts and clothing and jewels. And you could tell that the relationship between the two of them was really, it was one of uh, sibling love. It wasn't, it wasn't one of him wanting to use Mary um, as a pawn or her wanting to use Henry to try and get ahead just because her brother was king. The two of them really did love each other. And now in the same vein, he also loved Charles Brandon. I think Charles was able to live a life that Henry had wanted to live and that Henry was sort of able to live through Charles to a certain extent as a young man, especially after Arthur died and then Henry was heir. The two of them uh, really did have sort of a brotherly relationship where Charles was, he was of course older than Henry. And so he sort of, I think, guided Henry uh, or was someone that Henry aimed to emulate, but it still doesn't jive with knowing how vindictive Henry could be later in life. I mean, you don't behead two wives and somehow be a softy, you know, but it does seem like he was for Mary and Charles. I think that with Henry, you were in danger if you threatened Henry himself, if you threatened his masculinity, if you threatened his authority in a personal way, which he definitely felt that Anne Boleyn was undermining um, a lot of his authority. Poor Catherine Howard, I mean, didn't really stand a chance, um, in my opinion, being married to Henry. But as far as, as his sister and Charles Brandon go, sure, it was a shot to his right to choose his sister's husband. But it wasn't something that I think he took personal offense to. I think he was well aware of their relationship. I think he knew that when Mary had him make that promise at the water's edge that Charles is the person that she had in mind. And I think he just didn't like how they went about it because he wanted to be the one to say, okay, you two marry each other. And since he didn't get to do that, uh, they they did have to pay him a lot (laughs) to to like them again. Um, But he, he didn't have any problem doing that. Yeah, I think you're completely right. I think with Henry, it was always, as you say, whether he felt that was a personal attack, but I think it was always about power as well. Mm-hmm. And if he caught any whiff of the of, of hidden agenda, that's it. You were destroyed. You were gone. And I don't think yeah. he, I don't think he sensed that with Charles and Mary. I don't think he thought Charles was trying to somehow, you know, take the throne through Mary or anything like that. Oh no. So, well, uh, and in their letters, they uh, they didn't really make any secret of saying, you know. Henry, I'm so sorry for doing this. You're the person who should have made this decision. But as my ever loving brother, I know that you will forgive me. Or as my longest friend, I know you know that I will only ever serve you. Because I mean, Henry's counsel would have been way too happy to see uh, Charles Brandon lose his head. And and Henry was the one to have the power to, to shut that idea down. So I think I think you're right that since it wasn't a shot um, to Henry's personal power and that they didn't seem like a personal threat to him, he was he was able to dismiss it. But man, they got lucky. Very lucky. Goodness <laughs> me. I like I say, I can't think of another example, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. like that. Fantastic. This has been such a great discussion. Now we are up to the point in the episode where we play our game of 10 to go. So okay. are you ready, Lacey? Yes, I am. So tell us about something you love about where you live. Oh, geez. Okay. So uh, I live in the mountains uh, in the eastern part of the United States, and it is just beautiful. Year round, we have some of the best views. There is never um, a boring drive. If you're driving more than like 10 minutes down the road, you know, especially this time of year, you're going to see some pretty leaves, but we have just wildflowers in the spring. We have gorgeous uh, scenery in the summer. Fall is my favorite because I like the, the red, yellow, and orange leaves. And then winter, as long as I can be inside, I like the snow and we get a lot of snow. So, so I would say that, um, the seasons and the scenery is definitely something that I love about where I live right now. And that I would really miss uh, if I ever had to move. You you said you're doing a lot of reading for your personal projects and study and all those sorts of things. So what's the last book that you either bought or that you read? Yeah. So that's, that's always one of my favorite questions that you ask people because I like to make a little list. Um, so <laughs> I wanted to give a plug to a book that I've been reading off and on. And one that I often return to for my dissertation, my, my dissertation is on the human face in the middle ages and different medieval understandings of what the face could communicate. So I have been reading Jack Hartnell's Medieval Bodies and it is a 
fascinating book. And it gives you a lot of insight into how medieval people really understood their bodies and, and what all their bodies could do, you know, the different possibilities and limitations. So it's, it's a really, it's a fascinating read. And one that I just keep coming back to, because it seems like every time you read it, there's a different little nugget of information you can pull away. That sounds great. And I feel another book purchase coming on, which happens to me every single time. I can't believe it. Anyway. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> do you have a signature recipe? Oh, Natalie, I do. I like to cook. Um, so I, I think I have a lot of signature recipes. The one that has been really popular in my family recently has been a black bean chicken enchilada that I make in a yeah. slow cooker. So you just kind of add everything into it give it four hours and it, it essentially cooks itself. You do have to put it in wraps after that, but it is, it's a healthy meal. It's a light meal, but it's filling. So I would say that's, that's my signature recipe today, at least. Yeah. I love that. Can you please send me the recipe? Cause I love I slow will. cooker recipes because they're, so, as you say, have, they're so easy. <laughs> yeah. I have a little, um, really nerdy cooking blog that I keep track Ooh. of my recipes on. Yes. I'll, I'll send it your way. So Absolutely. You can please do. I love that. Much. Now you, you sound like you're an incredibly talented woman already, but if there was a new skill that you could learn, what, what would it be? Hands down, I would love to be able to play the piano. I would, I'd really love to be able to play any musical instrument, which I cannot do. Um, and I can't read music. I've never even tried, but I would, I would love to play piano. I actually have um, a little one-year-old daughter who I told my husband that when she starts piano lessons, I'm going to start piano lessons along with her so that she'll, she'll have to drag her mom to class, but I'll be able to hopefully learn how to play something. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. I'd love to play the lute. I want to, I want to be a oh tutor woman. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be so fun? That would be really oh, good. The lute would be up there. I have to add that to the list. <laughs> yeah. And what do you like to do to unwind or to relax? So I, unsurprisingly, I like to read. Um, that is, I, I feel like that's probably a really common answer that you get because I think a lot of us uh, who are on your podcast are probably pretty like-minded. But in my opinion, there is nothing better than turning on a lamp in the evening, having a cup of your favorite decaf tea and opening up a good book to just lose yourself in uh, for a couple of hours. That's always, always my ideal night, even though it's, it sounds a little boring. Um, that is what I like to do. Now, of course, we're um, heading towards Halloween, mm -hmm. which I know Americans are big fans of ha Halloween. <laughs> yeah. um, so do you <laughs> like to watch scary movies? Are you a scary movie person? Oh, so I, I don't like the scary ones because they do scare me. They work on me. Any of those horror films, I mean, I like have nightmares um, about them, but I really like the kids Halloween movies from like the 90s when I was growing up. And I do... Um, I don't know if you get like the, the old Disney movies uh, in Australia, but there's one called um, Halloween Town <laughs> okay. that I have watched uh, since I was a kid and now watching it now, you know, it's, it's like, oh my goodness, it's kind of corny, but it's still, it brings back like that um, nostalgia for me of thinking about just how excited you get about uh, Halloween as a kid and watching um, like Hocus Pocus and Twitches and all those old movies that, well, I guess not. Maybe I'm dating myself. They're not old, Natalie. They're only from the 90s. Um, but but that really were like staples of my childhood. Yeah. And my favorite holiday is Christmas. So I um mm -hmm. I do exactly the same. I watch all the movies and cartoons and stuff that I watched as a child. And mine goes back a little bit further than yours. Um, so I love <laughs> I it. I love too. the Christmas movies too. Oh. I, I'm a love actually fan. Have you seen oh, Love Actually? Yes, I love it Love Actually. That is my, it's my yearly uh, Christmas yeah. movie. That's what I, I do. I wait until like, I try really hard to wait until the 1st of December, but normally I don't even make it till the 1st of December. No. And then I start rewatching it. And I have to say the Griswold is one of my absolute <laughs> Favorite. It's my husband's I favorite. It. Oh my gosh. I watch it every year. I think I memorized most of the lines that you can't say here because there's way too much swear. Oh yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're right awesome. on that. I will, I'll give a plug for the, uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol, which I personally think is one of the best Dickens adaptations that I have seen. They, they really knew what they were doing, uh, with that movie. And it's another one that, that we watch every year. Oh, it's so good. We're coming up to that season. I'm yep. so excited. <laughs> so do you have any pet 
pets? I do. So I have um, a dog named Tucker, who is my pretty constant writing companion. He's always right there uh, when I'm working on my dissertation. So he's going to have to get a shout out in my acknowledgement section. <laughs> and then I also have a couple of cats, one of which is um, Broody, who features in my history with cats videos that I make yes. uh, on Twitter. And she is she's just a really for the most part, calm little cat who will let me hold her while I talk about historical things for two minutes. So I can't not give Broody a shout out. I think she's deserved it after all the stuff I've tried to teach her over the years. <laughs> yes. Are you still, because it's a YouTube channel as well? As so this? yeah, it's, it's a YouTube channel. That's, um, that's where I put all of the videos just to kind of try to save them. I'm mostly active uh, on my Twitter account, but actually right now I am at home at my parents' house because we are selling our house. And because it's the time of COVID, uh, the baby and I came to stay here for a couple of weeks while our house was being toured um, and sold. And so the cat is being boarded. You'll oh, be happy to know that she has a, a corner suite at the boarding facility. <laughs> she is treated like a queen there, but um, our videos are on hold for a little bit. Hopefully by the time this episode will, will come out, I'll, I'll be able to make another broody video if anyone wants to check it out. Absolutely. Sounds good. And I'll put a link on our show notes to your Twitter and your YouTube. So what is your favorite form of exercise? I like to do yoga. Um, I am, I'm really into like the beginner yoga videos on YouTube. I've been doing them for a couple of years and I have not advanced past beginner, but I still have fun with it. I think it's a good time. And the, the cats absolutely love, uh, when I do yoga because I get down on the floor and they're able to kind of come and hang out a little bit, but that's, that's my exercise of choice. Yeah. Fantastic. And lucky last, what is a subject that you wish you knew more about? Well, probably math because math has never really been my strong suit. What I would like to be able to use math for is to be a little bit better at money conversions from the Middle Ages and the Tudor period, trying to convert money into modern dollars to try and make sense um, of what different things cost at the time. I find myself just constantly typing in money converters um, yeah. <laughs> on on Google so that I can, you know, try and get an idea of how much stuff costs. I would like to be able to just do that in my head. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Save absolutely. Me some time. I imagine you've used the National Archives one then. I have. <laughs> I yeah. Spend a I spend a lot of time um, on that too. <laughs> yeah, that's th there are some good ones out there and then there are some not so reliable ones out yeah. there. So you have to be kind of careful with what you use. But but yeah, that's that's one subject that I would like to be a little bit stronger in. I'm definitely a history, English uh, languages type of person, not so much that other side of my brain. Absolutely. I'm just a funny story because you've reminded me with the maths thing. <laughs> I just a few days ago found my kindergarten school report. So I was oh. only four when I started kindergarten. I started school very early and mm -hmm. I was laughing to myself at my teacher in kindergarten next to the writing um, column wrote that Natalie is very interested in the written word, which I loved. I absolutely Aww. loved that even from then. But then I was laughing next to math. She put just satisfactory. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, Natalie, I have I never, I've never been good. It's never been my forte. And I just laughed that even at four, it was my writing that I obviously enjoyed more yeah. and my maths, not so much, but well, you knew what cute. you liked. Yeah, exactly. yeah. You knew what you liked from a young age. My mom likes to, <laughs> she likes to say that I used to dictate uh, stories to her and she would write them down when I was like three or four years old. So it seems like we, we might be kindred spirits, Natalie. <laughs> Absolutely. I think so. And the very last thing, Lacey, that I ask all my guests is for a tutor to takeaway. So this is something for our listeners to go off and check out after the episode. So do you have a tutor takeaway for us? I do. So what I would really encourage people to do, because I am um, a historian, first and foremost, I like to really get to know the period based on primary sources. So like I said earlier, I do a lot of reading um, of conduct manuals and literature that was put out at the time that we know that people, especially in the uh, royal family and in the noble classes would have consumed. And I think it helps to really get us in the mindset of people who would have been living um, in Tudor England to read some of the late medieval and early modern works that are available out there. So archive.org is obviously, and I'm, I'm sure it's been mentioned here tons of times because it is just such a great resource. Uh, it's free. You know, you can find almost anything uh, Tudor on there. And I would recommend to look at uh, Hall's Chronicle is one of the best sources uh, to, to really get a feel for Tudor England. Also different works of literature, conduct manuals like the Romance of the Rose. And then my personal favorite is called the Book of the Night of the Tower. And it gives you some just really 
juicy details of what it means to be a good woman and a bad woman in the Middle Ages and early Tudor period. And it was a super popular um, conduct manual. And I mean, it covers makeup and hair dye and plucking your eyebrows could get you sent straight to hell in a handbasket. And it, it is just such a rich source of different examples of good women and, and deviant women, um, essentially. And to think about what people would have taken away um, from reading that source is just completely fascinating to me. And you, you can find all of those, uh, those three different works on archive.org if that's, if it's something that you'd be interested in reading. They sound fantastic. And I have to have a look at that one. So the book of the night of the town, I'm going to, mm-hmm. to check that out. I love the title. It sounds amazing. It's, oh, it is. It is really, really good. It's my personal favorite. So had, had to mention it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Lacey, for coming on the show and talking tutors with us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ali. I had so much fun. I hope you have a good day. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.